anticipating that we will have more people join as um, over the next few minutes. Um, and while we are transitioning, I just wanted to um, uh, put in a plug, um, kind of echoing the uh, currently doing some of the risk updates right now and wanted to make the connection between today's topic um, and how it's related to nutritional risk. So um, how often does risk 383, the neonatal abstinence syndrome, come up when you're doing your assessments? Often? Yeah. Okay. Did you say also with the foster? Yeah. So that's an interesting point because sometimes I am wondering if people think that once these little ones get into foster care, then everything's magically. No, that's not the case. Okay. What has been your experience, Jill? So usually the foster will have the, the baby as it's discharged either from the NICU or at birth and um, definitely drug impacted. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely. Hey, this is, this is Annie here. Hi, Annie. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> So I, my question of this is, I have a lot of kids who I know have been exposed, but they don't have an actual diagnosis that anyone knows of, of neo eight abstinence syndrome. So I think I see a lot who I, I suspect, but I don't document it as that. I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah document, but don't sign. Um, right. Yeah. Unless it's you document it, you wouldn't risk it. I don't risk it. Yeah, I document it, but I don't risk it. Is that lingo that I need to understand? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I say there was drug exposure. Yeah. yeah. Suspected. Blah blah blah. Well, I don't have a diagnosis from a foster because they'll actually know that. That's an interesting Versus point. A parent yeah. is listening to say, "Well, this is right, right." But it still has to be diagnosed by a healthcare provider, not by foster parents. Don't. <laughs> but it does raise an interesting point, especially as we're getting um, going into kind of developmental screening and understanding that better. Because if we, um, it, it's how do we have that closed loop uh, communication with uh, some of these uh, physicians? And that might be a good question for our speakers: is if we suspect, how do we proceed? And yes, I totally agree with what Kim was saying um, if that it, it it's not for us to diagnose, but um, if uh, we do see some of those signs and, and concerns. So if we don't assign, but they may have some residual uh, delays. Um, so this is an interesting one that kind of overlaps into the developmental. How did that happen? So, um, I recognize that right now it is 2.29. Um, and um, I, what's wonderful about in the room here is we've got a full uh, room of uh, dietitians, but we're also being joined by breastfeeding um, coordinators in the room. And we welcome um, the, uh, those joining in the room, but also by phone. And what we're asking uh, in, to save time for our speakers, um, and I'm hoping that Sarah is joining soon. Um, is go ahead and uh, type in, if you are at a computer, type in that you are present so that we uh, can recognize um, that you're with us. Um, and uh, we see that Sarah and her team in Southern Oregon are on the phone. So um, Sarah, I don't know how much of the um, discussion you were just hearing about how we are making the connection with um, what risks that we assign in uh, TWIST, or data system for WIC, uh, related to neonatal abstinence syndrome. And um, I will um, step aside and have you introduce yourself and your team and bring up your slides. Or, yeah, or tr we can transition to hers so she can control her own slides now. Whenever Sarah is ready, we are ready. Sarah? Do we, we didn't, we, I didn't mute here, did I? That would be. Okay, Sarah, can you hear us? Someone else has started sharing, which ended my presentation. Oh, Sarah is sharing her desktop. 
Okay, and Sarah, we can see that you are still muted from your end, so we cannot hear you from the room. We didn't plan for that. I'm just she just opened it again. So if you can hear me, uh, when we did the practice run, there's this small microphone at the base of your screen. And if it has a line through it, that means you're muted. If you can click on that, that will unmute. Yep, that one right there. There you go. Uh, now can you hear us? Now can you hear us? Now Oh, there's a little bit of an echo. Are you calling in through a phone and on the computer? Yes. Just, um, just like in practice, if you mute the um, computer, then your phone will work. Okay, now now we're, we're off the phone and on the computer. Okay. Can you hear us now? Yep. Okay. okay. Hello. We're ready for you, Sarah. All right, well, we are ready to go. I am Sarah Strubig. I am a registered nurse at Asante Rogue Regional, and I am one of the lactation consultants here. And I am joined by um, two other members of our team. I'm, my name is Hillary Handelman. I'm a certified nurse midwife, and I work here at Asante as the clinical practice advisor. Hi, and I'm Debbie Archer. I'm an occupational therapist and I work in the NICU and pediatrics and in our outpatient clinic. Can you guys hear us okay? Yes, everything sounds good. We will, um, we will let you know if we're not having, if we're having technical difficulties with this. Okay, well, we will go ahead and get started. Okay. So we want to share with you today about our, um, our product called Deep Sleep Console, which is a model that we developed for the, for the care and treatment of babies who have been exposed to opioids in utero. And I, I heard a little bit about your discussion earlier that you have feel like you've seen this frequently in the populations that you've been taking care of. And that is true nationally. It's a big problem, and we'll be talking about the scope of that problem today. And before we really jump into it, let's just get onto the same page with a few key definitions. So neonatal abstinence syndrome is the term that is used to describe a group of symptoms that occur in a newborn who's been exposed to drugs in utero. Now, drugs in utero can mean a lot of things. Um, not necessarily opioids. So let's dig, in, dig into that a little bit, a little bit deeper. So many substances can cause some form of withdrawal in the baby, some evidence of it. And you'll hear people talk about this, families talk about this. They, you may see withdrawal in a newborn with any of these substances that you see here on the screen. And people are often surprised when, um, when you see evidence of jitteriness and irritability in a baby who's been exposed to perhaps um, a mom's, an antidepressant in utero. Or, I'm sorry, were you saying something? Okay. Okay. An antidepressant in utero or tobacco, many substances can cause some evidence of withdrawal. But in this model and in all of the models across the country focusing on supporting babies through withdrawal, we focus on opioid exposure only. And the reason for that is because of its onset and its timing of onset. I'll go into that a little bit more deeply. So an opioid is a derivative of opium. We usually think about them as being a medication 
medications related to pain relief. So there are, there are illegal forms of opioids, and then there are prescription forms of opioids, heroin, fentanyl, Vicodin, oxycodone, all of those um, are forms that are prescribed or may be illicitly used. And then there are medications that are used to treat opioid addiction or opioid use disorders, things like methadone, subutex, if at any point while I'm talking, someone has a question or wants me to pause on a certain slide, um, I'd be very happy to do that. So please just interrupt and let me. Okay. I'm moving through these, assuming that we can keep on going. So an opioid use disorder is the term used to describe um, is is sort of the overarching term used to describe anyone whose use of opioids has become problematic in their life, whether because of, of, um, because of addictive behaviors that have developed out of prescription, prescription use or illicit behaviors. All of those can fall under an opioid use disorder category. And the things that make opioids really important to the population of babies that we serve is that this onset of symptoms is significantly delayed. We don't see it right away. So if a baby's exposed to something like, say, a methamphetamine or cocaine or a substance like that, we're likely to see the symptoms within the first 24 hours. They develop quickly in the baby. We can see them pretty rapidly. We can identify that this baby is withdrawing and then we're able to give the baby some short term support and then the substance will leave their system. Now, there might be some residual effects related to the substance that they were exposed to in utero in their growth and their development. But we but when we're treating just acute symptoms of withdrawal, those substances have a rapid onset and then those substances leave the baby's system, usually by the time the baby is being discharged from the hospital. What's different about an opioid is that it can take three to five days or even a little longer to show us the symptoms. And then those symptoms can last a very long time in the life of the baby. So they may leave the hospital still quite symptomatic, even if we give them a prolonged length of stay. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But that is the specific reason that we focus on opioids in this model. So when we look at opioid use disorders and who's affected by opioid use, it's really important to understand that this is a national epidemic that crosses most demographic lines. The reason I like this slide um, from the CDC is because even though the data is old, it demonstrates that the people that we are seeing the, the most rapid um, growth in their opioid use disorders are women that are in the childbearing age group between 18 and 25 and are in the non-Hispanic white demographic and often um, are, many of them are in a median income group and many are insured. That's a, that's a different type of demographic than we have, than we have seen when we've experienced uh, um, a lot of when we've reviewed addiction studies in demographic groups before. So it's important to recognize that when you see a woman sitting in front of you, you may not have any um, visible evidence when you look at her that this woman has an opioid use disorder. She may look like you. She may look like your best friend or your sister or your mom or your daughter. She may not look like someone who you would expect to have a problem because anyone who has ever been given a prescription for a pain medication is at risk for developing an opioid use disorder. So it's really important to break down in your mind any kind of um, any kind of thoughts around, oh, well, I would see it in someone. And earlier in your conversation, you were talking about suspecting like suspecting use. If you have, if you may maybe are talking with a client and you and you look at her and you're suspecting, that may be true that you're seeing that, but, but I bet there are twice as many women that are sitting in front of you not showing evidence that you wouldn't suspect. And that's what I hope we can take away 
from this thought is that this um, that this epidemic crosses all demographic barriers into um, the groups of people we would least suspect. Does that make sense? I, that will be rhetorical. Moving on. OK, so every 25 minutes, a baby is born suffering from opioid withdrawal. This is from 2015. So when we're, you know, we're four years beyond that now and we have decreased, our opioid statistics are continuing to rise in our country. So when you think about symptoms of NAS, you may have seen some of these symptoms in babies that you have, um, that you've observed. So they often can have irritability with an excessive or a high pitched cry, excessive sucking with poor feeding and slow weight gain diarrhea or vomiting, fever, hyperactive reflexes, increased muscle tone, sort of a rigidity, rapid breathing, tremors, and or seizures. And these are just the most common. There are more, but these are some of the things you might commonly see manifesting. So when we understand the syndrome, we need to recognize that the vast majority of exposed babies will develop an symptoms. So if a woman is taking um, an opioid at the end of pregnancy or during her pregnancy, um, 55 to 94 percent of the time her baby will develop some symptoms. So that that's the majority of women and they might be taking an opioid that was prescribed to them by their OBGYN and taking it exactly as they were asked to take it but if they were taking an opioid near the end of pregnancy, prescribed or not, they are very, very likely to have their baby experience symptoms of withdrawal. This is an important thing to understand because I think women often feel like, well, why would my baby be withdrawing if I was simply taking a substance that was prescribed to me and I was, and I was not, it was not explained to me that my baby may have this consequence from my substance use. And that's a really important question um, for all OBs to be faced with if they are prescribing during pregnancy, that they also need to be educating women that the baby may experience these symptoms of withdrawal, regardless of how the woman was taking the medication. We can't correlate use patterns with withdrawal symptoms. So you can't say to someone, well, I was, she was only taking one Vicodin this many milligrams at this number of days before she gave birth. So we can, we can anticipate her baby's withdrawal pattern. We can't do that. If a, if a woman was taking an opioid during pregnancy, her baby is in that high risk category and may experience the symptoms regardless of the use pattern or the dosage. So there are opioid receptors concentrated in the CNS and GI tract, and that's important to understand because the symptoms are often exacerbated by um, aggravating the CNS and the GI tract. And we aggravate those parts of the body um, through excessive stimuli or hunger. So if the baby's in an environment where there's a lot of stimuli, bright lights, noise, or they're just being moved around a lot and transferred around the room, that can be very overwhelming to their CNS system and they will start to demonstrate symptoms. If a baby becomes hungry, that can, that can be another trigger for symptom development. And it causes the baby to struggle in areas of key function, eating, sleeping, and consolability. And that's what we focus on in the eating. SC model is helping the baby to function um, productively in those three areas. So I want to take a moment to go back to the topic of, um, of the delay the, of the onset of the symptoms. So if you look there at heroin, the baby will start to demonstrate symptoms typically in the 24 to 48 hour um, after birth range. And then the symptoms can last for eight to 10 days ish in studies. When you look at methadone, the onset is even later and the symptoms can last longer up to 30 days or more. Buprenorphine, which is subutex, which is subox, subutex um, that one has an even, even um, longer onset of delay, onset and delayed duration and prescription of 
opioids in general fall within that range. So it's important to recognize that even if we keep the baby for a prolonged hospital stay, something like five days, which we'll be discussing here, they will have these symptoms when they come to see you for their WICO appointment up to 30 days or longer. And some research has demonstrated continued symptomology um, up to the six month mark. So, so we, will, we will be coaching these families in how to care for their babies at home independently because the symptoms are not gone by the time they leave the hospital. So when these families go home with their babies, the key is, um, is to understand that if the baby can't eat, they can't sleep, and they can't be consoled, and the family doesn't learn the skills to help them, the largest risks to the baby are child abuse and neglect. Shaken baby and failure to thrive are our biggest risks in this population because if families go home without the skills and the tools that they need to feed, console, and put their baby to sleep, they will become extremely um, exhausted and agitated by the baby's needs and will struggle to care for them. So this initiative I'm describing to you today is all about educating the family to be effective in their parenting in those three areas so that they, the baby is less at risk for child abuse and neglect. And the incidence of abuse is tripled with drug using caregivers and or environmental stressors. So they, if you have a family who has, who has a substance use issue and a stressful home environment, we are tripling our risk for the baby to experience some type of abuse at home. So I want to describe for a moment the old model, the way that we have cared for babies with NAS historically in our hospital and in hospital systems all across the nation. It's still true that this model I'm describing to you now is the, is the majority of um, care, is what's still being used by the majority of care environments nationwide, but we're seeing a shift towards the new model I'll describe. I hope that you can get a sense of this old model. And if any of you have worked in hospital systems, um, you might be familiar with it. So we used to rely heavily on a tool called the Finnegan score. And it was a way of looking at those symptoms I told you about earlier in the baby. And every few hours, the baby would be scored based on symptoms. If the baby had a score of 24, um, either two scores of 12 or three scores of eight, that would be considered severe symptoms of withdrawal. And the baby would be taken to the NICU in most settings where a NICU exists. And in that NICU, the baby would be dosed with more opioids, morphine, to soothe their symptoms of withdrawal. The goal was to simply help them to stop um, demonstrating those symptoms, to be able to return to function with the use of more opioids. The baby may um, be dosed up to every three hours, some babies every two, some babies every four, and it may last 30 days or more in the NICU. Average lengths of stay um, in these models are often close to the 30-day range. And then babies would frequently be discharged with morphine drops for treatment at home, and their opioid exposure would continue even as an outpatient to soothe their symptoms of withdrawal. That was the old model. The results of the old model had a lot of consequences for the family system because the family was unprepared for NAS to occur. As I was telling you earlier, many women who are taking an opioid during pregnancy, they don't know that their baby may withdraw from that opioid exposure. And if they would start to see those symptoms of withdrawal, they often would feel very frightened by that and unprepared and guilty because they felt that they did something or took something that caused these symptoms in their baby. These feelings of guilt often led to feelings of disconnection. And then there would be real disconnection if the baby started manifesting severe enough symptoms and the baby was separated from the family. The baby would go to the NICU and the baby would be cared for by the staff primarily. And it caused a lot of staff fatigue as another, um, as another consequence of this model because it's very hard to care for those babies even within an institution by staff members. Um, these feelings of guilt um, and, and disconnection often were major relapse, relapse risks for families. It would have diminished um, family bonding effects long-term, increased family stress, and then the increased, of, increased risks of abuse and neglect we talked about earlier. And I think one of the most significant 
um, byproducts of this model was is the long-term opioid exposure that may put the baby at further risk for opioid addiction or substance use disorders later in their own life. So this model is ridden with complex social, emotional, and physical problems. So there is a doctor who works for, um, he works in the Yale system on the East Coast. His name is Matthew Grossman. He's a pediatrician, a pediatric hospitalist there. And he developed a theory when he had his own baby and he had his own child and he was a very fussy infant. And he took note of how he cared for his own infant when his infant was being difficult to feed, difficult to console and difficult to put to sleep. In those moments with his own baby, his baby would be swaddled, his baby would be held, his baby would be put skin to skin, his baby would be fed on demand, and his baby would overcome the issues related to sleeping, eating, and being consolable. And he noticed that in his own very fussy baby, who was so fussy that that baby looked very much like many of the NAS babies that he was caring for in the hospital. Yet the NAS babies in the hospital weren't getting the benefit of swaddling and skin to skin and being fed on demand. They were receiving the opposite treatment for their similar symptoms to a fussy baby. They would be isolated from their caregiver, put in an isolate, and dosed with medication. And he saw this discrepancy and said, I want to do a study and see if we take care of these babies the way that we take care of all fussy babies, the way we take care of my fussy baby, how will it impact them? How will it help them to recover from their NAS symptoms? And he did this study over a course of years at Yale. This study has been so transformative in the medical community that many, many hospitals picked model. And this is what has been the impetus for us to transition to a, a new model as well. I'll show you some of his results. So first he looked at the criteria and he first just said, we're going to make this really simple. We simply want to, we don't care if the baby is going to continue to show some symptoms of withdrawal. That's going to be a given. The baby will be shaky. The baby may have some diarrhea. The baby may be agitated. The baby may be crying and fussy and jittery and all of that. But the big questions are, can the baby eat? Can the baby sleep? And can the baby be consoled? And he defined that as one ounce or breastfeed effectively. Can the baby sleep undisturbed for an hour at a time? And can the baby be consoled within 10 minutes of an intervention? And that doesn't mean you do it for 10 minutes and then you can stop. That means you do it for 10 minutes, and then if you keep doing it, will the baby be still? If you are holding the baby and rocking them, after 10 minutes of rocking, will they settle down? And then you have to keep rocking them. That's part of it. It's not that this baby is going to suddenly become easy to care for, because they're not. It's just that this baby is going to be able to be consoled if you find a way to console them and then you have to continue persisting in supporting them with that intervention that helps them. So with this model, they saw an incredible decrease in the length of stay. Their average was 22.5 days and in the new model they were able to see these babies going home at 5.9 days on average. And that doesn't mean that they're going home asymptomatic. It means that they're going home with families prepared to support them so that they can safely continue to meet their milestones of growing well and being cared for in a safe environment at home. Their number, their percentage of babies treated with morphine went from 98% down to 14%. So, so less and less and less babies require the medication. There's still a possibility within their model to treat a baby with morphine if the skin to skin, the swaddling, the calm environment, the on-demand feedings, the shushing and the swaying and all of the interventions don't work, a baby may still require a morphine dose here or there on a PRN interval. But their use of morphine dramatically decreases in this model overall. And then you see some incredible breastfeeding um, success 
tax rates. We, in their model at Yale, um, you know, an East Coast community that doesn't have the same type of breastfeeding culture as we have in Oregon, when these babies were separated into the NICU, there was no breastfeeding happening anymore. Um, but they were able to bring that breastfeeding rate all the way up to 60% by the time this model was published. So this is a summary of those same findings we just discussed, and it also adds in their average cost of care. So they went from being nearly $45,000 per baby per hospital stay down to less than $10,000 per baby, which is an incredible, um, incredible savings for the system. So we took their model and last year we adopted it and we created our own approach and hospitals all over the nation are creating their own approach to this model. But um, I think that I think that our model is a leading model for our state because it takes into consideration some of the unique characteristics of our community. Here's a little picture of our model. We focus on consistent prenatal screening. So identifying who is in the model is really key. And that's a bit of what you were just talking about, is how do we make sure that we're getting all the right people into the model from the beginning? And once they're in the model, they need to know that they are going to have a prolonged length of stay. Um, their observation time with this baby in the hospital will be about five days because after the baby is born, because we want to see the symptoms of withdrawal manifest in the baby if they're going to become symptomatic. Um, we make sure that, the, that they stay in the room together all of the time and that the baby would never be separated from the parent for NAS alone, that they no longer would go into a NICU if they start to demonstrate severe symptoms, because the demonstration of a severe symptom simply indicates the need to increase the um, non-pharmacologic support for the baby and then decide if the baby requires any kind of medication down the line. I'll go through these, these pieces a little bit more here in, current, in future slides. So in our first 12 months of the model, that was from June of last year to June of this year, we cared for 66 families in our year. And they were a mixture of different demographics. We had chronic pain patients that were on prescribed opioids. We had women in recovery who were taking Subutex, Suboxone, or Methadone to support their recovery. And then we had women illicitly using opioids or heroin. And here are our results. So in our baseline, our baseline information, our morphine use was at about 35% and it decreased down to 4.5%. In our first year of use of our model, in 66 patients, we administered morphine three times. And you can see that there um, over on the far right hand column, you can see our morphine use was three babies um, in 66 patients. And our admission to, to the NICU, I'm sorry, I'll start with length of stay at the top to be less confusing. So our length of stay, you can see our baseline there in 2016, 2017, before we initiated any model at all, we were keeping these babies on an average for about six to uh, about seven to eight days. And I think that that's different for us here than at Yale because we usually use more, um, more Subutex and Suboxone and less Methadone in our community. Methadone has a, has a more um, severe symptomology that manifests in babies. And so they, they withdraw more, um, more gradually with the Suboxone or the Subutex medication. And we have more of that use here. So our length of stay was shorter to start than Yale's. But you can see the second column there is an in-between year where we were trialing more interventions um, that were supportive for the baby. We were trialing keeping more, making skin to skin a greater priority for these babies. And you could see that some of our middle of the road interventions were already starting to have a significant effect. But in our 2018 and 2019 year, that was where we were using the model fully and we had a complete and total transformation in our care model. And that's where we really see the biggest effect. So you can see the decrease in our length of stay, the decrease in the morphine use is really dramatic. Our admission to the NICU rates dropped in general, and these, these NICU 
really relate to babies who have comorbidities but are also withdrawing. We disqualified anyone from our study group that was premature or had a significant genetic or medical condition. So these are more or less healthy babies, but they may have been admitted for a reason to the NICU, like transient tachypnea of the newborn or something um, like to rule out an infection. 30.3% of these babies spent some short time, but only 1.5% of them, a single baby, went to the NICU for NAS only, and that was a baby who was transferred to our system without a caregiver. So in summary, um, I just want to share a couple more tips about how, how this model has been effective for us. It starts with educating the family and ensuring that they really understand it. And I think that you might have had an opportunity before coming to your class today to see our short video that we use to begin the education for the families. This is available on our webpage at asante.org, and it's an eight minute video that we utilize heavily in the community in providers offices. And we have partnership with our, with our, our local WIC office um, to be aware of this resource as well. And this is something that just, it's an educational tool to let families know before they give birth that, that their baby is likely to withdraw and how they might be cared for when they come into our system. It helps them to feel educated going in. So when they have their baby, we basically are welcoming them to their five-day parenting training, their very friendly boot camp. And the idea in our training time with them in their, five, their first five postpartum days is a consistent message from the healthcare team of support and empowerment. We want them to understand that they are what their baby needs to recover. That, they, that there is no substitute for the nurturing and support that they provide to their baby as the family. And the baby care needs to be provided by the family. The nurse in this model acts as a coach, an educator, a support person, but the nurse does not take over the care of the baby. The five days of care need to be done by the parent so that they go home having had a lot of practice so that they know how to help their baby function most effectively at home. We also work with them in the five days to help them to um, identify their own support system, to empower and educate the support people in their life so that they're able to have a team of people to parent with. So we might bring, you know, if a family comes in and has a grandmother or a friend or a neighbor who might be able to help them care for their baby at home in the future, it would be great if they came and provided some of the support in the hospital because they get to also benefit from learning from the model and getting to know the needs of the baby so that when they when the family goes home, they go home with it with a care team in place. And that's a big piece of the coaching. We focus on creating that quiet, and quiet environment to decrease that um, sensitivity of the central nervous system. So we talk about making this room a womb and bringing back home for the baby the kinds of calming influences that were present for them in the uterus. We focus on feeding the baby adequately, and we'll talk a bit more about that, and then teaching the concepts from the happiest baby on the block. We use that video because it's just a very um, nice universal tool to teach the five principles of baby soothing that are accessible to families, swaddling, sidelining, swaying, shushing, and sucking. And if you haven't ever seen that video, it's very, very, very helpful um, for fussy babies and all babies and NAS babies also fit into these, this group. And then we focus on the ongoing support after discharge, making sure that these families go home with resources like public health nurses that are going to be visiting them at home, um, knowing how to access lactation support, their WIC office, um, ongoing resources at home. Okay. So that is the end of my section. Can I just pause here and ask if you have any questions and then I'll pass it over to Sarah um, to do her to do the next section. And if there are no questions right now, I'll um, we pause again at the end. Hi, Sarah, you are unmuted in the Department of State Office. Lily. Any questions for Sarah? I just wanted to ask Sarah. Hi, Sarah. This is Kelly. Um, nice to hear your voice. 
Um, do you know what other hospitals are following kind of a similar model, perhaps in the Portland area or other places in the state, or where we might be able to find that information? Yeah, so OHSU is also adopting an Eat Sleep Console model. Every hospital's model might look slightly different, you know, facility to facility, but, um, but I know that OHSU adopted last summer as well. And so, I'm not saying okay. and so they, um, they would be a local resource up in the Portland area to see what their model looks like. On the East Coast, um, last summer, 40 hospitals adopted the model. So it's really been widespread over closer to Yale. Um, but we are one of the early adopters on the West Coast. And, but I know that OHSU has followed close behind us. Thank you. We have another question here um, from Kendra. What is the cost of the parenting boot camp for the family? There, there's no additional cost for them to stay. Um, it's basically just staying with the baby. The baby is a patient who gets a prolonged stay, and the family is the parent is discharged at her typical length of stay. So if a mother has a has a vaginal delivery, she'll be discharged on day one or day two, and she'll simply room in with the baby in a postpartum room to provide support and parenting care. Um, so her length of stay is not prolonged. She doesn't remain a patient longer than she would have normally. It's the baby who has a prolonged length of admission. And so the family needs to provide a caregiver for the baby's entire stay. And that's often a very tricky um, piece of this model is ensuring that the baby is never left alone without a caregiver and that the family understands that. That's a big piece of the coaching, that the baby is not admitted to a NICU environment where they might be cared for by the nursing staff. The baby needs to remain in constant supervision and care of their family. Thanks. I think that's it, Sarah. Okay. So thank you. That was Hillary Handelsman, and she is um, the, the creator of this program. So she is the one who did all the background information and was the catalyst for us um, incorporating this care model into our hospital. We, we also Got a comment from Autumn that says, um, we are incredibly grateful to Hillary and the Eat Sleep Console team. They presented recently at a staff meeting and the information they shared brought us the tools to have more compassionate conversations with our moms who uh, disclose opioid use. Disclose opioid use. Uh, we've shown the video and we're so fortunate to have this in our community. Oh, that's great. Yay. Yeah. Just about the video, the link to the video that was in, in the PowerPoint slides. This session is being recorded and the PowerPoint slides will be made available to everybody. All right. Thank you for that. So um, we continue with the education of the family about the needs of their NAS baby. And one of the big parts of the care for them is to um, provide increased skin to skin contact because it um, is a great soothing and coping mechanism for the baby. Um, but that can also be a barrier um, with the family to being able to provide that 24 hour support. Um, babies also have the increased need to suck. And so, so when babies are breastfed, that puts a lot of additional stress on the mom's breast and nipples. Um, and so we try to discuss and work on making sure that her latch is good and appropriate so when babies are doing their excessive sucking, they're not causing maternal damage, which will then um, eliminate possibly the desire for the mom to continue breastfeeding because of nipple pain and damage. So we can provide nipple protection with use of a nipple shield, um, and we can have the baby sometimes use a pacifier for that non-nutritive sucking that is part of their withdrawal symptoms. Babies have um, the need for excessive sucking and they are not able to self-soothe, so they're always sucking. So it's very hard to differentiate um, cluster feeding, for instance, um, and the need for food as hunger, sim as hunger symptoms. So um, sometimes using a clock and actually having scheduled feedings for a baby so that they can learn to self-regulate and using a pacifier 
um, can help with this excessive sucking that can be um, counterproductive for breastfeeding. There is also the case of excessive rooting for these babies because their reflexes are very um, pronounced. And sometimes babies will be frantic at the breast um, and not be able to latch easily um, due to their withdrawal symptoms. And again, the mom, we're trying to empower the mother. And so we don't want her to misinterpret that, um, that reflex for not wanting the mother or not wanting the breast milk or not liking her. So we really encourage um, and help with positioning and support the mom in getting the baby to have a really good latch and be able to tolerate being at the breast and skin to skin with that mom so that she can be part of that baby's treatment and um, feel confident in her, her uh, maternal skills. We use uh, very structured feeding positions, keeping the baby in really close to the mother. Um, sometimes we use swaddling in order to have the baby's um, reflexes be nice and tight. Um, and Debbie will talk about that in a little bit, the use of swaddling. Um, we can use a nipple shield for breastfeeding for additional oral stimulation. Um, the nipple shield also acts as a guide so that babies who have an uncoordinated suck um, can begin to learn where their tongue needs to be um, placed for breastfeeding. And we can use um, sideline positioning and um, more of a football hold positioning to um, help babies secure that latch and be able to um, tolerate feeding at the breast. And as the milk starts to increase in amount. Oftentimes these moms have a very large milk supply. Um, and so the different positions will help babies be able to control that flow a little better and not be overcome by um, a large fast milk flow right at the onset of letdown. Babies can be uncoordinated um, with because of the NAS. And again, that, that additional support is really important. Um, some babies will need extra milk given at the breast, and we do that um, with a supplemental feeding where we put milk in a feeding tube um, at the breast so that the baby has immediate gratification of having um, food there, and then they can remain latched and continue to um, feed and get the mom's direct, the milk directly from her breast. Oftentimes, there may be a need for a referral for a feeding specialist um, to assist with the uncoordinated um, feeding issues. And oftentimes, the babies can have dysphagia, which is a direct result of the inner uterine um, drug exposure. And so we work really closely with our pediatric and speech pathologist to work on the baby's coordination of suck, swallow, and breathing at the breast and being able to um, take full feedings by mouth because that's a very important skill before they go home. We want to help establish breastfeeding safety for these babies. Um, our moms, many of them will have a urine drug screen done at admission and if they are positive for illicit drugs or amphetamines, they are prohibited from breastfeeding and providing their breast milk to their babies. Um, but moms who are in um, treatment can breastfeed their babies. Mom who are, moms who are using um, opioids as prescribed are able to breastfeed their babies um, because the maternal milk is best for the baby. And the milk, the, the drug exposure, the drugs that transfer into the breast milk actually help relieve some of the symptoms of withdrawal. Um, being able to breastfeed provides these moms with empowerment and confidence that they can they can actually take care of this baby. And for many of these moms, this is the first time that they have been put to the task to take care of anybody besides themselves. So it has a really um, big effect on, on their life and their commitment. And oftentimes providing breast milk to their babies is a, a huge reason for them to um, seek formal treatment um, and to stay clean from illicit drug use. 
If a mother is able to console her infant during withdrawal, she's going to feel um, much more successful and better prepared to manage the infant after discharge. And so many of our moms, you know, they spend five days in the room with the baby and they may step out for periods of time if they have other family members um, who are able to uh, be part of that care. But it's a really great opportunity for them to bond with their baby and to get the outside support as they navigate through the withdrawal symptoms that their baby may be having um, and have staff available to them for assistance um, throughout that entire stay. So it, again, it's important to have a safety plan because we do not want to expose babies to more illicit drug use, but, but breastfeeding while on methadone or subutex is recommended um, as long as a mother is using the medication as prescribed and not using illicit substances um, and has tested negative for counterindicated infections. So we allow our moms who are on these um, prescribed medications to breastfeed their babies. Um, and we do a lot of counseling of moms who may have some illicit substances on board um, as far as getting them into a program and trying to help them establish a milk supply um, while they're working on that so that at some point they are able to breastfeed their baby. If a mom is on um, either higher levels of methadone or subutex or on some other medications for uh, perhaps mental health issues, um, we can consult our inpatient pharmacy to review the medications and um, determine their safety for breastfeeding. Babies who are going through withdrawal um, have an increased caloric demand. Um, so it's really important for us to evaluate as many feedings as we can really lay our eyes on to make sure that the baby is receiving enough milk. I mean, we may be providing the milk, but we don't want the milk um, being, you know, spit up or being um, allowed out the side of their mouth. We want them to actually take in the milk into their stomach where um, they get that comfort from the GI tract. We may discuss the need for supplementation if they are losing weight and feeding very frequently and not really taking a lot of um, milk at one time. Um, sometimes there might be a need for fortification. So we follow the Yale model in that um, the recommendation was 24 calorie formula if a baby is formula fed. If a baby is exclusively breastfed, the baby will get its mother's milk and um, perhaps donor breast milk as the mom's supply is increasing. Um, we have donor breast milk here available that we purchased through the Northwest Mother's Milk Bank that we use with these babies who have um, that higher need and the mom's milk supply isn't quite to that level yet. So it's a great resource for us to be able to offer that milk to them. Um, we also want to assess for adequate milk transfer and making sure that the baby is taking in as much milk as it can with each feeding. Um, Rarely, babies will be uncoordinated, too uncoordinated to safely oral feed, either by breast or by bottle, and they will need a NG tube um, to get through the worst part of their withdrawal because they are not able to safely suck, swallow, and breathe. If breast alone is not enough, um, we do have, like I said, the donor breast milk is an option for supplementation. Um, one of the biggest things that we have all of our moms who are in this model, we have them start um, pumping right away uh, because we know these babies are going to require the additional um, calories and the additional milk sooner than later. And so we want that mom's milk supply to come in. We've also noticed that a lot of these moms, because the babies are at breast so frequently and there's a lot of stimulation, that they end up with very robust milk supplies. And so the pumping helps keep the breast soft for um, the baby while they're at breast. And so they, they can end up with a lot of stored milk when they are discharged. Um, but if a mom is supplementing at the breast or using a bottle after breastfeeding, we wanna make sure that she's pumping so that her body responds by making more milk. 
and we use donor milk as a bridge. Like I said, um, this is a picture of, of a supplemental system. Um, this mom has a nipple shield on, which provides that additional oral stimulation um, and structure for a baby to latch onto. And then there's a little tiny five French feeding tube that's tucked in there. Um, and connected to that feeding tube is a syringe of um, either donor breast milk, most likely donor breast milk, or extra maternal milk that she had pumped. But it provides the baby with a, um, a nice bolus of food while they're at breast, while they're waiting for the breast milk itself to come directly from the breast. We use donor breast milk as much as we can um, once a mother consents to its use because it is more um, sensitive on the baby's gut. And it has been said that the, the gut of a baby who is in withdrawal or has been exposed to drugs in utero um, is pretty compromised. And so we want to make that transition really comfortable for the baby. Um, there are some considerations for formula as well. And if a mom is unable to provide her breast milk, um, we, she has formula to give to her baby. Um, the length of additional caloric need will depend on the onset and length of active withdrawal. So as you saw in the prior graph, um, the extra calories may be needed for up to a month after that initial withdrawal period because babies will continue to burn calories um, as they are more hypertonic and they have that additional sucking um, and they're just very much more active and burning more calories. So we need to identify the caloric need to increase their weight. Um, we watch their weight really closely in the hospital and when they are discharged, they have follow up with their pediatrician shortly after discharge, and then perhaps another check um, a couple of days after that, either with lactation if they're breastfeeding or in the pediatrician's office for another weight check. But we really want to not have babies lose weight in order to realize that they need the additional calories. So keeping them on a higher calorie formula if they're formula fed um, is a good idea once they are home. And the MD can order the additional calorie formula um, when they refer for babies to increase their calories um, while they're using the WIC provided formula. And again, we talked about the 24 calorie formula that was used in the Yale model. Um, but when babies are very tense and fussy, they're burning a lot of calories. As, and uh, the excessive sucking also um, uses a lot of calories. So this is the recipe um, that we use here at Asante. Um, if we have uh, babies who we need to increase the caloric value, um, we actually have 24 calorie formula, but if we are out, we will um, adjust it accordingly. In our NICU, some of our NICU babies get fortified Breast milk, we don't use that model for our ESC babies, but the recipe is, is there, what we put with breast milk um, to make 22 calorie formula. Because we don't know how many calories breast milk has, it is assumed that breast milk has between 19 and 20 calories per ounce. But in looking at all the different mother's diets and all the different mother's milk, um, milk is made at different caloric values. So we do talk a lot about, um, we educate the families as far as hunger cues and the difference between um, the need to suck and cluster feeding for breastfeeding babies. Um, we want to avoid gastric discomfort with babies. And so we will use slow flow, slow flow nipples or um, a Dr. Brown's bottle um, to help them be more comfortable with feedings. We will teach families how to pace feeding so that the baby doesn't become overwhelmed and is able to maintain a coordinated suck and swallow and breathe. And then we want to make sure that babies have small frequent meals rather than larger meals spread apart. Hi, I'm going to just start talking. I'm Debbie Archer again. I'm an um, occupational therapist in the NICU and also in pediatrics and maternal 
Um, and um, a lot of these babies, um, really, because of their um, hyper-reflexive, um, they, they have um, a very excessive moral reflex. They have tremors. And so um, for breastfeeding and for bottle feeding, we um, provide very um, uh, tight swaddling um, with the arms up towards the face. I know in the um, in the program with the um, the happiest baby in the block, a lot of times they teach you to put the arms um, extended. Um, we recommend a better developmental position is, is with the arms flexed, um, and um, and then swaddled up um, at, at the top of their chest under their chin, um, and that can um, help the baby to organize the tighter swaddle. Also, um, with the arms up against the chest, can also provide. Um, ventral uh, pressure, which has a calming effect. Um, and um, many of these babies um, we feed in side lying, and that's sort of a position that's used for breastfeeding too, so it's a natural position. But um, when we're bottle feeding, the reason that we're using it is because a lot of these babies, because they're so disorganized with how they're um, sucking, they are just of gulping, um, and what um, put, putting them in sideline is a gravity eliminated position and it allows the extra milk to go down into the cheek versus straight down the hatch. Um, and it can um, help to prevent um, the baby from coughing and sputtering um, and becoming further um, disorganized. So we do recommend that. Then um, Sarah also talked a little bit about pacing. So when we're talking about pacing, we're talking about um, keeping the bottle in the baby's mouth, but tipping down um, every few sucks to allow the baby to swallow the milk that's already in their mouth. Um, and that can be very helpful for babies who are doing lots of gulping. Um, when babies are doing gulping, that's just not a sustainable way to feed. Um, and it also can lead um, to coughing. Um, and uh, swallowing discoordination. So, and also a lot of air swallowing, which will further um, cause more gastric discomfort. Um, so trying to uh, eliminate that. So it's, it's sort of an elevated sideline position. And um, in this picture, it shows, um, I, I don't know if you can really see, but ideally, um, you know, having the baby on a pillow um, and then also on your leg, but not up in the air is helpful because um, you're giving full body pressure, which can be comforting and also offers the baby more support. Okay, so um, our team is called the Pediatric Assessment and Therapy Services Team. We have a physical therapist, I'm an occupational therapist, and we have a speech pathologist. Um, some of the things that we offer to the babies that are um, that are going through withdrawal are a neurodevelopmental evaluation at discharge. Um, many of us are uh, certified in neonatal massage, um, and we offer that um, at, to teach parents um, as needed. Um, we offer feeding evaluations uh, by referral, um, just depending on how much, you know, if the child is actually um, having, you know, more trouble than is typical. In other words, they, the nurse really feels like the baby's getting into trouble with um, actual choking on the formula, that kind of thing, um, and is unsafe. Uh, we also offer um, parent teaching about development and safe to sleep. Um, about assessing head shape and how to comfort their baby. Um, we also have a developmental follow-up clinic, which we serve uh, the um, we serve multiple many different types of babies in that clinic. But um, the NAS babies are part of that. We also see preemies, um, but we have them come back for visits at three months of age, twelve months, and twenty-four months. That's just our regular program. If we have um, a significant concern about the child's uh, feeding or development, um, we may have them come back sooner than that. Um, but that is our normal schedule um, for these infants returning for follow-up. Uh, then we also have, um, when they come back to see us, we make referrals to early intervention if we see a significant 
significant delay, or we also have um, out, outpatient treatment in our clinic, um, and they can get um, speech therapy, occupational therapy, or physical therapy. In addition, we also have a pediatric feeding clinic, um, and we may see some of the babies back for their feeding. Um, at, you know, at pretty early at discharge. I mean, I'm not necessarily seeing a trend where um, they have ongoing issues, although um, children who are drug exposed, you probably noticed, have um, more of a um, chance of having sensory issues, um, and some of those sensory issues can impact feeding. So what is the criteria for going into our developmental follow-up program? Um, we can we see um, children that are exposed to all sorts of different types of drugs, including marijuana, where they'll still go into our program with marijuana exposure, opiates, alcohol, all of those different drugs that you see there, including, um, like Sarah said, including um, children that are exposed to, um, you know, different types of prescribed medications medications like seizure medications, um, antidepressants, um, such as Zoloft, and um, it, it's, there's just interesting how many different types of um, prescribed drugs are, can cause um, NAS, um, and I just uh, had our pharmacist um, review that for me, and um, she's verified that Drugs such as Celexa, Zoloft, Prozac, Cymbalta, um, Effexor, um, and then drugs like um, Ativan, Xanax, and Clonopin um, all um, are known to cause um, NAS symptoms. So um, all of those kids are at risk, it just place them at also at risk for a developmental delay. So that's why we see them in our follow up clinic. You might be interested to hear. Some of the other criteria, you know, are, um, you know, just um, being premature, having low birth weight, being small for gestational age, um, having um, a lot of um, need for respiratory support, having BPD at, at discharge, microcephaly, low APGARs, and um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, seizures. Um, and some of these things can be combined, um, you know, some of the babies are full term, but not all of them. So we might have a baby that has some of those other criteria in addition to having gone through withdrawal. Um, so what are some of the things that we see at discharge with these infants? As Sarah and Hillary both said, um, these children are still having symptoms related to their withdrawal at discharge. Um, we see them, we um, do an evaluation called the Hammersmith Neonatal Neurological Examination. Um, it's it's um, pretty much um, going to be that they're going to have a suboptimal score. So when we say we have a suboptimal score, that means there's an indication, a need for um, re-evaluation. Um, some of the reasons that they don't do well on the evaluation is that they, they have significant hypertonia when we try and assess um, some of the normal motoric items on the test, we can barely um, extend their arms and legs um, to do a item called like a recoil. Um, they have, if they do have active movement, many of them have hardly any active movement because they're bracing with their arms and legs to try and comfort themselves. That's, you know, they're very tightly wound up. Um, in a fetal position, so it's very difficult to get them to move out. But if we do see them have active movement, they have tremors, frequent, frequent startles, their movement is extremely disorganized, and that is why, even though typically you don't have the baby wrapped up for breastfeeding, that we do swaddle them frequently because they do not have um, the ability to organize their movement um, or to stay calm if they, um, you know, if they are moving actively. Uh, you know, they have a high state of irritability, which means that they don't, they're not able to achieve a quiet alert state. So be able to learn something for your environment, to bond 
with your parent. You have to be able to achieve a quiet alert state to be able to look around and start to notice things like your parent's face. Um, to notice things, you know, to be uh, visually alert. Um, they often are, are not able to self-soothe, um, so that's why we have to offer them a pacifier. They're really are having difficulty, um, you know, they may not be able to bring their hands to their face to suck um, on their hands. Um, they often have um, a high-pitched cry. Um, and if you've heard that with um, neurologically impaired babies, that's what it sounds like. Um, they have gaze aversion, which isn't very helpful for bonding because when they when they um, gaze on something and it's overstimulating, they tend to move their eyes away from that stimulus. Um, we talked multiple times about hyperreflex, uh, hyperreflexia, and um, that is the you know like a hyperactive. Starter reflex, hyperactive moro reflex. Um, they are poor feeders. Um, they have trouble visual tracking. You kind of have to be in a quiet alert state to do that anyway. So those that usually is not going to work. Often what we see is this all or nothing. So it, you know, they're either shut down and they're tightly wound up and their eyes are closed and you know they're trying to block out or they're uh, you know or they're awake and they're screaming. Um, so sometimes it's really hard to get them in that in-between state. So that's kind of um, where we see them. Some, you know, there's there's um, a range there. Um, I did see a baby the other day that actually had um, was able to actually get in a quiet alert state, and her parents had been doing a lot of kangarooing with her. Um, so there is a range there, but this is, you know, typically what we do see. Um, you know, so a lot of disorganization, disorganization of movement and state, especially when unswaddled. So, one of the things that was in, I kind of did a um, literature review, and as always with um, whenever you do a literature review on any topic, there are, you know, different conclusions. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was this study. It was a small study. Um, they had um, 14 babies um, that they looked at against a control group of 14. Um, so it was a pretty small group, but they did see that um, there, there was a um, brain difference um, in the babies that had, um, you know, been exposed to opiates in utero. Um, and what they found was um, a thinner cortex um, in the right lateral orbital frontal cortex um, and they, that could be related to um, cognitive and behavioral, behavioral difficulties. Um, and those are some of the things that, um, that children have delays in and, or have difficulty with are um, in the areas of cognitive and behavioral. So that, I thought that that was interesting. Um, there were lots of interesting things. You know, um, a lot of times the sample size wasn't big enough to draw a major conclusion, um, but you know, there's certainly indications that um, you know that there are brain differences um, with children that have been exposed to um, opiates, and uh, also even um, with. Uh, a group of children was studied and they, there was a higher um, risk of having um, strabismus um, with children who had been OB exposed in one study. It was a pretty small group, but so there are some physical um, differences. There also, um, one of the other studies showed that um, there was a significant association with oral clefts and heart defects. Um, and then among cohort studies, um, club foot was uh, a, um, frequently reported um, birth defect. Um, and then um, neurological outcomes, preterm birth, small for gestational age, lower birth weight, reduced birth weight, and sudden death um, sudden infant death syndrome were all things that um, that were more frequently seen or were risk factors for children that were exposed to opiates. 
um, and then um, neuro, um, neurodevelopmental outcomes, significant impairments in cognitive, psychomotor, um, behavioral issues, um, and uh, these were um, seen in infants and then later in preschoolers with in longitudinal studies um, that had been ex um, chronically exposed to, to opioids. Uh, so this was a study that was done in Michigan. Um, uh, many times um, in studies, they do the Bailey, um, and that that's what we use in our clinic. Um, the Bailey uh, just is a standardized assessment um, that has that looks at um, cognitive, motor, language, all the different areas, um, and it, it's standardized, so it's easy to use in studies. Um, but what they found in this particular study was that the children um, at in the first year of life were had a more normal performance on the Bailey, but then in the second year of life had a more significant decline um, in the performance on um, the they call it mental development, but that's the same as cognitive cognitive development, also in the psycho psychomotor development, um, which is things like um, eye-hand coordination um, and um, being able to do more complex tasks that involve hand, foot, um, and, you know, eye and using your mind. So things like, you know, catching a ball, playing a musical instrument, those kinds of things um, would be examples of psychomotor development. Um, but the conclusion of that study was that overall that they had poor performance for mental de development, which they felt was due to um, the social environmental risk factors and a delay in psychomotor, which was due to reduced birth weight. So that kind of brings us back to the physical effects of being exposed in utero. Um, and many of these studies, it's very interesting because it, it, it makes it a lot, pretty complex to study, is um, that the children that remain um, in the homes of um, parents who are either have continued drug use or um, have um, limited parental skills and are not providing a very stimulating environment. Um, that is um, one of the considerations um, about what is causing the delay. Is it the original in utero exposure, or is it the is it um, growing up in an environment where the child is not always the focus? If the parents have lapsed into drug use again, or if they just simply are not able to provide a very stimulating environment um, for the child. Um, this one also was an extremely interesting study. Um, it was done in Israel, and they had a lot of different control groups. They looked at um, children that were exposed. Um, they looked at mothers um, and fathers who were um, heroin dependent, um, and they there were actually effects on the children if the father was a heroin user. Um, in a, and then they had a group of mothers, you know, so the baby was um, had exposure um, in utero exposure. And then they looked at um, another group where the children were exposed, but they had been adopted out. So they had a adequate, adequately um, stimulating environment. Um, and uh, then they had just like a group of kids that were just sort of normal functioning kindergartners. And they compared all those groups. Um, and they felt that if the child didn't have, a, you know, the, the, at the get go, have significant neurological damage, um, that their in utero um, drug exposure, um, the, how, how affected the child was had more to do with their um, home environment than the actual exposure. So that was two different studies that concluded that. So the reason I'm bringing that up is because it, it's, it, um, support for the families after discharge is extremely important and identifying the children who are struggling 
before they get to school and getting early intervention are very important because their brains are growing so rapidly between um, zero and a year. They need that extra help early on because we can make a much bigger impact with their development if they're receiving help earlier on. Um, and um, that can just make a really big difference. And so it's significant that, you know, there are effects directly from the drug exposure and also effects that continue um, from being in a uh, um, home environment that is not stimulated and not dedicated to um, raising the child. Um, I would like to speak to this. Uh, polydrug use. Many of our parents, it's not a sole drug that they're using. Many of our parents, these um, children are being exposed to more than one drug. Um, nicotine is a very common one, and I was, I, I always knew about low birth weight associated with nicotine. Often we will see a child that um, has tremors at discharge, those kinds of things, but I didn't realize that um, you know, in some of the longitudinal studies that they really had, um, some of the studies have shown that the children have increased impulsivity, attention problems, negative behaviors, poor language development. It was pretty significant for nicotine. So not only are they exposed to the, the opioids, but they're also exposed to some of these other drugs. We all know about alcohol, um, that it can cause fetal, fetal alcohol effects or fetal alcohol syndrome, which is a pretty significant in terms of um, you know, the developmental impact of um, poor, uh, poor language, poor memory, academic problems, um, problems with executive functioning, um, as they're teenagers being able to make good decisions. Um, and, you know, the marijuana studies have been difficult. Um, you know, they've, some of the studies have found um, that there's deficits in problem solving skills um, that require visual memory, um, that there are attentional difficulties, that they have trouble um, with the integration of all of their learning skills to be able to problem solve. So, and then methamphetamine can affect um, fetal growth and infant neuro behavior. Um, they felt like that the studies with methamphetamine were, were in their infancy so that they couldn't really draw any specific conclusions, especially, you know, there hasn't been, there haven't been that many longitudinal studies for that. Um, so, Sarah, would you like to finish up? Sure. So, um, the Eat Sleep Console model, we educate our parents and our families um, on while they're here in the hospital for their five or so days. Um, and then we problem solve with them so that they have a good plan in going home and that they continue this model, especially as the symptoms of withdrawal um, continue. They may not be as significant, um, but they still may continue. And it's important for the parents to realize that um, that the symptoms may um, arise when they least expect it. But because they had been here in this environment for five days, um, they have learned how to um, console their infant and be able to um, control that situation a little bit better. We also put it out to community partners to reinforce the model. And that's through the pediatrician's office. We've worked, we've worked with lots of, lots of community partners just to help make this model standard in the community. Places like the inpatient treatment programs for moms and babies, a residential treatment program. Um, all of those treatment programs that house moms and babies have been educated in the model. Um, so that they can reinforce these principles when the family is living there in their treatment center. And that's been really important because many of those treatment facilities have been very receptive to creating things like a quiet room so that if a baby's really um, becoming um, difficult to soothe, that the mom has a place to go outside of a community space <coughs> to be able to nurse her baby and, and create that kind of a calm, quiet environment that the baby needs. <coughs> Um, so the, so the, the inpatient treatment facilities have been important partners, and so have, the, um, so have the, the outreach facilities that go into families' homes. 
We've done a lot of work with the public health nurses, with the, um, with the programs that go and provide home visitation so that all of the families um, that are receiving home visitation services, that all of those home visitors are aware of what they learned in the model while they were with us in the hospital, and then they can reinforce those same principles when they visit in the home. So that's been helpful too. So that is it for our presentation. Do you have any questions or have any questions come through? Okay. I get a stack of questions there. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to um, kind of uh, ask a question about, Sarah, you mentioned that it's important with these babies because they are so, um, they have such difficulty regulating themselves that um, uh, it's helpful to do the swaddling and also to uh, use pacifiers. And those are a couple of things that in more recent years um, with breastfeeding support, we encourage parents, you know, not to use pacifiers in the first month and maybe not to swaddle, you know, it's sort of we move away from swaddling so that the, uh, the baby and the mom can, uh, the baby can, you know, touch the breast and do all those things that really help, you know, um, breastfeeding. So, um, um, so I guess I just wanted to ask, have you run into any trouble or do you have any tips for how we can navigate that? Because as WIC staff, we don't always know, you know, that the, there's a situation where um, we might have a breastfeeding diet that's uh, experiencing uh, NAS. Right, right. So I will let Debbie address the swaddling. Um, we do try to do as much skin-to-skin -skin breastfeeding as we can, but some babies are just not able to handle that much stimulation at the breast. And so then we bring in this, you know, a swaddling as a method to try to help make that a more comfortable experience for them. It's, it's interesting, a lot of these um, babies, they just have a great deal of trouble being unclothed, period. Um, and I, I think one way to sort of gauge um, with each, each individual baby and kind of assessing where they're at with their withdrawal, because if their withdrawal symptoms are starting to diminish, um, and their movement is more organized and they're not hyper reflexive, that would be the time to perhaps start trying to move towards more skin to skin. Um, and you can ask the mother um, or parent, um, how is your baby tolerating being undressed? Because if the baby still is just absolutely going ballistic when they're when their blanket comes off and um, they're unclothed, then they may not quite be ready. Um, and kind of looking, you know, what happens if you unswaddle them? Do they become just um, organized and start to startle tremor and, um, you know, just come unglued? Um, then that's not the time quite yet. So it's about assessing where the baby's at at that you know, at that time when you're when you're helping them on to breastfeed. Thank you. That's that's really helpful, especially that question about how does baby react to being undressed. Thank you. Can I say one more piece about um, about the pacifiers? Um, this is Hillary. We we also have a lot of concern about pacifier use in our hospital because we're moving towards baby friendly um, accreditation next year. And so pa avoiding pacifiers is very important to us as well, but it's not, it, these babies don't fall into that category of a well baby because of this diagnosis of having NAS. And so pacifier use for them may be very appropriate when it wouldn't necessarily be encouraged in a, in a typical scenario where, um, where a baby is really just needing to focus on learning the principles of breastfeeding. So it's one of those considerations that um, is a bit different in the case of a baby with NAS. And so the lactation consultants and the nursing staff really work individually to see, does that would this baby benefit from it? And then customize that baby's care based on what the baby really um, seems to need to become calm 
to be able to sleep and to be able to eat. Great, thanks for expanding on that, appreciate it. Um, sorry, I have one more question. Um, we haven't had a first one, so go ahead, Sonida. <laughs> What's your first question? Okay, another question. Um, in terms of breastfeeding, you mentioned uh, that because of some moms might have a strong letdown that you recommend sideline. And I was just curious if there's been any information available on uh, laid back nursing or buyer nursing in terms of the letdown or also with the skin to skin contact. Um, or if maybe babies are a little bit too disorganized to be able to um, do so. So, and by sideline, um, we are referring to them being more in a, like a traditional football hold, but on their side, not sideline, like on a flat bed, um, but in a sideline, very close um, position next to the breast where they're kind of curved around the mom's body and that milk is allowed to leak out the corner of their mouth if there's a lot of milk. But the laid back positioning is also very beneficial because the baby is fully supported um, on the mom's body and can then control the milk flow a little bit better because they are um, more on top of the breast and able to um, control that just a little bit better. What we try to avoid with our moms and try to teach them is to not feed in traditional cradle hold or even a cross cradle hold because the the likelihood of babies being overcome by milk flow is pretty great in those positions because they are very gravity dependent. Okay, great. So I just wanted to verify whether bio nursing had been tried and it sounds like it's been successful for some moms. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, this is Cheryl. I do have one um, in terms of um, how many of your moms that went through the study this last period of time, how many do they typically go into treatment? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because many of them came into, into the, the model in treatment. So out of the illicit, the folks that are illicitly using when they come into the hospital, then that's just a really case by case process of trying to work with that family to decide, is she ready to engage in treatment? Is she, is her, is her, um, is her substance used to the point that she needs to be in inpatient care? Can she be in outpatient care? It's very case by case, but we have a real mixed demographic of people who come into our unit already engaged in treatment and then a group of people who have not yet done that, but that's a, that's the smaller group. Um, the majority of the the majority of the cases um, have already engaged in treatment by the time they come into the hospital to give birth. That's a more common scenario than the illicit use scenario, but that occurs as well. I could get actual numbers out of our 66 cases. 66 cases, I would just need to total it up. I could do that in a follow up if you like. It's just a trust uh, model that you kind of wonder if they are more willing to or motivated to go seek services um, as a result of, of um, going through your program. I, I think that it's definitely motivating for them to, to bond with their baby, you know, in the days that they're there. But, but it's very difficult for them if they're actively using and dealing with their own addiction um, because then they are withdrawing as well. So it's hard for them to engage in the model when they are feeling their own symptoms of withdrawal. They're struggling to not be actively using themselves. So it's really complicated for those moms to even focus on the baby and the baby's needs because they are um, in such turmoil within themselves around their drive to use. So those moms are very hard to engage in the model. Um, and that's, that's a complex scenario when we face that because they're often um, really struggling with their own physiologic withdrawal symptoms and it's hard for them to focus on their parenting until they get into treatment and get that under control. Um, that it's a really it's a really tough it's a tough group to care for. So they may be motivated by their time with their baby but they're also really locked in the cycle of addiction actively in that moment. And it's hard to think outwardly um, at that time. 
So a follow up question is, have you found in your community a parenting model that works well um, for them to have the continued training and support around how to parent their, their infant? Yes, I, I'm really, I've been very excited about some of the programs that are available in our in our community right now. We have a, a really special model um, called the OASIS treatment program um, that's run by a family practice doctor and it's specifically to keep um, to keep these families engaged in treatment while parenting and providing all of the services that they need in one care home. It's similar to, um, there's a program up in Portland. Oh, I'm blanking on the name. Um, one of you Portlanders might be able to bring that forward. But there's a, there's a really wonderful nurturing program in Portland. And this OASIS program is a sort of a branch model of that that nurturing program in Portland. But I think that we're moving in healthcare towards more innovative ideas to support parents who are actively recovering to continue to parent through their recovery. And that's that's different than the way we've treated families historically when as soon as they're using and parenting that those things have to be separated. And, um, and, a, and a using parent, a parent who's actively engaging in recovery can and also really benefit from their um, from support in their parenting and become successful in both um, if they're motivated to be so. Do we have any questions for those on the phone? And I know we muted you, so if you have any to type in. Um... And you can unmute if you're on the computer, you can unmute um, at the little microphone at the bottom. And if you're on a phone, you can press star six to unmute. Only comment we have uh, as of now with Autumn said that WIC has been bringing our infant massage classes to Oasis, Oasis patients as well. Yeah. Thank you, Autumn. I'm so excited that you are part of our conversation today. I think that partnering, that the WIC services that are provided in communities can be really important partners for these families because you have ongoing connection with them frequently through these different you know, intervals in their life and they're motivated to actually show up to these appointments and come and see you because they, they need what you offer them. They need the resource. So where they might be able to blow off um, different appointments and not value coming to attend different types of visits, you may be one visit that they actually still do come to. And you may still have an opportunity when many other kinds of healthcare providers do not to continue to um, influence these families and provide this kind of support of communication. So I think you're in a really unique and important position um, because you have, you, you offer a resource that these families will continue to need um, and are likely to continue to visit you. Well, I, I know we're at time and I just wanted to do a, a thank you to all three of the speakers that um, we, you, based on rough numbers, you probably have uh, reached out to about 60 to 70 um, staff working in WIC across the state. So your reach has been great and your expertise has been wonderful. And we will be sending out this information and um, hopefully have a continued conversation about it. But I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, trying out a Skype presentation for the first time. And you guys did beautifully. And um, we just want to all thank you very much for So um, thank you so much, and um, we will uh, send out the slides. We do have a poster that we will be looking at of, about essentially drug, substance abuse prevention to get this conversation going in the clinics um, that we um, are piloting a couple of, uh, of agencies. So hopefully this will kind of spur and continue that conversation of safety and trust with WIC staff that was mentioned today. So um, that more information will come about that. And I just wish everyone a wonderful uh, Tuesday afternoon in August, and we'll uh, see you in November. So thank you so much, both for the breastfeeding coordinators, Kelly's yeah. is great, and uh, for Lon, and we hope that we can make something like this happen again um, uh, in, in, in maybe yet yeah, annual. So thank you so much. We'll sign out now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.